1901, the city of Buffalo was on the brink of what boosters believed was the city's most important chapter. If the year went according to plan, Buffalo would not only seize the attention of people around the world, but also seize its position as one of the United States' foremost cities in terms of technology, industry, city planning, culture, and architecture. Starting in 1897, Western New Yorkers began planning to bring a World's Fair to the region. Plans were paused, though, with the onset of the Spanish-American War. The Splendid Little War fought between the United States and Spain in 1898. The conflict resulted in the birth of a true American empire as the U.S. came into possession of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. When planning on the fair resumed, the planners now had a new theme. Wait, bleh. when planning on the fair resumed, the planners now had a new theme, a Pan-American exposition, a celebration of American imperial power in the Western Hemisphere. But more than that, they believed the Pan-American would show the world that in this new empire, Buffalo was the perfect example of a prosperous modern city, booming with industry and glittering with the new electric lights made possible by the city's proximity to the might of Niagara Falls. Just a few years earlier, the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago had reintroduced that med that Midwestern city to the world, no longer a country backwater, but instead a rival to East Coast cities like Boston and New York. This was Buffalo's moment to establish itself as one of the most important cities in the country. Around the same time that the city's boosters were planning the Pan American, they were also planning a luncheon to be held at the Delaware Avenue mansion of leading citizen John Milburn. The meal was held over the 4th of July weekend in 1898 and was attended by some of the leading industrialists of the region. Jacob Shulkoff of Niagara Falls Hydraulic, John J. Albrey of Ontario Power, Frank and Charles Goodyear, owners of a prosperous lumber, mining, and shipping company, Frank Baird of Tonawanda Iron and Steel, John Scrathard of the Buffalo Lumber Exchange, George Urban, president of Buffalo General Electric, and William Ely, president of the International Street Railroad Company. There were also lawyers representing the other Buffalo and New York State businesses such as New York Central Railroad, Erie County Savings Bank, and the Third National Bank. But the guest of honor was not a Buffalonian, rather a visitor from northeastern Pennsylvania, Walter Scranton, the operator of Lackawanna Steel, who was rumored to be looking for a new home for his growing steel business. The city's leading men were determined to make Buffalo that new home. At the turn of the 20th century, Buffalo was, to borrow a phrase from historian Mark Goldman, a city on the edge. Perfectly situated on Lake Erie, a hub for railroads, Buffalo was a critical part of the country's trade infrastructure. It was the ideal spot to unload cereal crops from the Midwest, for instance, to be stored in the city's many grain elevators until it could be moved along by rail or transferred to waterfront mills for processing. It had a booming shipbuilding industry for lake-going schooners and steamers. It was close to the incredible power-generating potential of Niagara Falls, the leader in mass-produced energy in the newly electrified United States. It had a small but growing steel industry and was looking for ways to rival Pittsburgh as America's steel city. The future, it seemed, was bright, glowing with electric potential. But... A key component of historical thinking is contingency, the idea that the path of history is not predestined, but reliant on sometimes unpredictable events and outcomes. In contrast to the theory of teleology, which presents history as a process where each event is an important step leading inevitably towards a predetermined outcome, contingency reminds us that actually things just happen, sometimes in unexpected, unpredictable, and unproductive ways. During the Pan-American Exposition, Buffalo was certain that the city's future would be shaped by the sparkling fair celebrating industry, technology, and empire. They were in some ways correct. They just could never have predicted exactly how it would have happened. Oh, they just could never have predicted exactly how it would actually happen. Today, as part of our ongoing series on the five C's of history, we're exploring the historical idea of contingency by focusing on the rise and fall and maybe rise again of Buffalo, New York. I'm Sarah. I'm Marissa. 
And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We want to thank all of our Patreon supporters and especially our fabulous auger and excavator level patrons. Carl, Hannah, Lauren, Colin, Edward, Iris, Susan, Denise, Agnes, Jesse, Karen, Maria, and Audrey. We can't thank you enough. Listener, if you're not a patron of this show, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com backslash dig podcast to learn more. Wait, let me do that again. Just go to patreon.com slash dig podcast to learn more. Contingency is a challenging historical thinking skill to wrap your mind around. It's the idea that in any given historical moment, the outcome isn't a given. For instance, looking back in time, it's easy and comforting for us to think that, of course, the Allies won World War II. The good guys have to win in battles between good and evil, right? This way of thinking about history is often closely linked to other ideologies and worldviews. I'm not a philosopher, nor have I ever studied philosophy. And in fact, I actually sort of loathe philosophy. But generally speaking, the philosophical theory of teleology can help us to actually understand contingency. Teleology is the idea that things exist for the sake of other things. Within history, a teleological view usually refers to the belief that one historical event takes place in order for the next historical event to then take place. In other words, one thing leads to the next in a straightforward in a straightforward moving line. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, which made the Americans enter the war, which meant the Allies won World War II, which meant the U.S. became the world's dominant power, right? Just as an example. The situation today is the destiny. All of the events of the past were just a way of getting here, that this was the necessary outcome. This way of thinking has often been a component of other ideologies and worldviews. For instance, grand narratives of history, which see historical events as part of a story that has led or is leading to a certain outcome, usually for a nation or group. For instance, many Americans have a nationalist grand narrative view of American history, in which things like the oppression of Native Americans, the institution of enslavement, and westward expansion were necessary building blocks to create the current, read, glorious U.S. state. Teleology is central to other historical interpretations. A Whig history, for instance, or a Whiggish history, as I like to call it, um, Mm -hmm. is one in which history is moving toward progress. A Marxist theory is one in which history is always moving toward a socialist utopia. A Christian history um, would be one in which history is always evidence of God's chosen outcome. Most modern academic historians today reject teleological arguments. Instead, modern history is heavily influenced by postmodernism, which rejects grand narratives, universal truths, biological determinism, and necessary outcomes. Instead, we try to think analytically and critically about why any given thing took place. An example of this might be trying to understand Victorian ideals of gender. Instead of simply accepting that gender ideas were natural or a given, scholars now want to know why Victorians believed women were naturally inferior, and then how those beliefs affected things like social structures or public policies. Contingency comes out of postmodernism. If one event isn't necessary or if one event isn't the necessary or the required outcome of another, then why did it work out this way and not that way? In other words, what are the turning points in history? In Buffalo, contingency is a major part of the way residents think about the city's history. Two painful examples that illustrate this really well is the what could have been thinking that surround the two pivotal moments in the history of the beloved Buffalo Bills. Hmm. In 1990, (laughs) this makes me like, (laughs) people who aren't from Buffalo won't understand, but it's like- it's but this like constant people, drag on your soul. <laughs> exactly. People talk about this every f-ing day. Like yeah, they will talk the about it forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It is part of our identity. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. um, in 1991, the Bills lost the Super Bowl by one point when kicker Scott Norwood's field goal attempt, um, when kicker Scott Norwood's field goal attempt in the final seconds of the game went wide right. Like just wide right, just like is upsetting yeah. to hear. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, a a phrase that strikes fear into the hearts of Buffalonians, um, even to this day. 
uh, gen- genuinely. Um, the game could have gone the other way had only the kick. Wait, the game could have gone the other way had only that kick had gone straight through the goalpost. Or if the Bills had put up uh, one more touchdown, right, and the, that kick hadn't even been necessary, or right. any number of other alternatives. More recently, the Bills lost in the divisional round after the Kansas City Chiefs scored a touchdown in the final 13 seconds of the game, then won the coin toss, which gave the Chiefs the crucial opportunity to score during sudden death overtime. Any Bills fan has wondered more than once, what if we had just won that coin toss? That's contingency, baby. <laughs> it's depressing, yeah, <clears throat> but it's. Super. I think it's actually a really useful way of illustrating the idea of contingency, right? Like it didn't have to work that way. Uh, But Buffalo's history has more turning points, moments that set into motion futures for Buffalo they wouldn't have foreseen, or perhaps more importantly, wouldn't have chosen. For the purposes of this episode, we're just going to examine a small selection of those turning points. But of course, you know, we could point to dozens, hundreds of others, right? We just can't do everything here. So don't take these as like sort of the two defining moments or three defining moments in Buffalo's history. They just are powerful examples of what we're trying to illustrate here. So let's start with the turning point that nearly every Buffalonian would point to, maybe other than the 91 Super Bowl, as the critical moment in Buffalo's history. In September 1901, the Pan American Exposition that we talked about at the top of the show was in full swing. Like the 1893 Chicago Columbian Exposition, the Pan American was a city unto itself, built to be beautiful but temporary. In the center was the Electric Tower, an ornate Baroque building at the end of a long series of fountains and water features topped with a massive tower that was illuminated at night with electric lights. On top of the tower was a golden statue of the Goddess of Light. The press gushed about the beauty of the grounds, especially the illumination. According to Edward Hale Bush, oh, had uh, brush? According to Edward Hale Brush, journalist for the Scientific American, quote, the great advance made in methods of electric lighting during the past decade renders it possible to effect an illumination at the Pan American more beautiful, more glorious, more wonderful than anything heretofore conceived or even dreamt of by the human imagination, <laughs> which is really a little over the top. <laughs> <laughs> It's better than anything that any human has ever imagined. (laughs) (laughs) Surrounding the electric tower were various buildings, a midway to the west, a stadium to the east, the electricity building, horticulture building, government building, agriculture and ethnology buildings all around sort of surrounding the tower, plus various hotels, parks, fountains and ponds. Suffice it to say, the Pan American was supposed to demonstrate not only the grandeur, but the possibility of Buffalo. The planners intended the fair to sell Buffalo to the rest of the world. At the time of the fair, Buffalo was bustling. It was one of the most lucrative shipping centers in the world and glittering with electric lights fueled by the might of Niagara Falls and humming with the first electric streetcar line in the United States. The city had produced two presidents, Millard Fillmore and Grover Cleveland. And was I mean, home... such as they are, right? Like, yeah, they like... were proud of them at the time. We're a little less proud now. <laughs> yeah. It's like the crappiest ones to have. Right. Um, <laughs> and it was home to modern buildings designed by leading architects like H.H. H. Richard like H.H. Richardson and Lewis Sullivan. The city was still small, with only 350,000 residents, but it was growing and surely would continue to grow if the fair did its job. Buffalonians weren't just emotionally or psychologically invested in the fair. They were literally financially invested in the fair. When the planning committee went to Washington to pitch Buffalo as the location for a 1901 World's Fair, they knew that they weren't the only city in contention. Detroit was also gunning for the bid. The Buffalo committee knew that showing up in Washington with proof that the city was fully on board would strengthen their case. At a banquet in 1899, wealthy industrialist Frank Baird suggested that if the city's leading men made grand public gestures out of buying stock in the fair, it would influence others to do the same. Quickly, the city's leading citizens had pledged half a million dollars, but the numbers rose as average folks bought in, too. And I should say they actually like have this this luncheon banquet thing. 
and the <laughs> the the goal is actually to like stand up and like make a declaration that you had invested in the fair like it, in this way that was kind of like an i am spartacus kind of thing where like <laughs> yeah. each each man would stand up and be like i have invested in the fair no and i would... have invested exactly in one by one yeah. yeah really strange yes but it worked uh, and in the words of historian Margaret Creighton, quote, newsboys, firemen, artisans, laundrymen, butchers, and factory laborers all invested money, too. The Polish community chipped in. The police chief put in $100. A three-year-old girl named Esther Wedekind sent in a bag of pennies. Oh, like from Wedekind Wedekin yeah. funeral home? Oh, okay. I think so, yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so um, the fairgrounds were beautiful and visitors poured in. So on Buffalo Day, one of many themed days, 162,652 people visited the fair, representing almost half the entire population of the city itself. The cool lake breezes, beautiful summer days, and endless entertainments of the Pan American made Buffalo the center of the nation's attention in the summer of 1901, and the city's boosters hoped at least some of that attention would stay. They couldn't have anticipated that while the nation would pay very close attention to Buffalo for some time to come, it wouldn't be for any of the reasons that they hoped. By the end of the summer, attendance was not quite at the levels that the fair's planners hoped for, and worse, it was not turning a profit. But in September, in the waning months of the fair, came what many hoped would not only be the crowning glory of the the fair, but the event that would set attendance records and increase profits, an official presidential visit by William McKinley. McKinley arrived in Buffalo on September 4th with his wife, hosted by John G. Milburn, a, a prominent citizen and president, actually, of the Pan Am's board of directors, the guy that we mentioned at the beginning, and we'll come back around to him again. Uh, I talk about another event in Milburn's uh, tenure in Buffalo. Milburn conveyed the presidential couple in his exquisite Victoria carriage on a quick tour of the fairgrounds before returning them to his Delaware Avenue mansion. The next day, McKinley visited the fair along with 116,000 other people. <laughs> He listened to a concert by John Philip Sousa and watched a fireworks display promised by the planner as the, quote, largest pyrotechnical display ever seen. The following day, Thursday, September 6th, McKinley held a reception at the Temple of Music, an Italian Renaissance building. When the doors opened at 4 p.m., McKinley stood at the front of the auditorium and hundreds of people stood in a single file line waiting to meet the president. After only a few minutes, an anarchist named Leon Shoglosh made it to the head of the line. As McKinley reached out his hand to shake Shoglosh's hand, Shoglosh shot the president twice in the abdomen with a revolver concealed under a handkerchief. The Temple of Music descended immediately into chaos. A man named Jim Parker grabbed Shoglosh, keeping him from escaping and slamming him to the ground until he was set upon by guards and eventually hauled off to the Buffalo to the Buffalo police headquarters. McKinley was removed to the fairgrounds hospital. The presiding doctor, the prestigious surgeon, Roswell Park. Wait, that's a person? Yes. I for some reason I don't I don't think I knew that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Anyway, the preceding doctor, the prestigious surgeon. Sure, the prestigious surgeon, Roswell Park, was in surgery in Niagara Falls, leaving only gynecology professor Matthew Mann from the University at Buffalo Medical School to attend to McKinley's wounds. Western New Yorkers will recognize that name as our uh, cancer center is now named for Roswell Park, um, who founded it. Mann sewed up the president's wounds, and then McKinley was then taken back to John Milburn's mansion, assured that the damage was mostly to muscle tissue and thus not too serious. The president convalesced at the Milburn home for a week and appeared to be steadily improving, but on September 14th, after a sudden turn, McKinley died. An autopsy later showed that the bullets had not simply passed through muscle tissue as the initial doctor had thought, but had damaged McKinley's kidney, stomach, and pancreas, and that the bullet's track had become badly infected. Theodore Roosevelt, the vice president, had been in Buffalo only days before, but left for a camping expedition in his beloved Adirondack Mountains when he was assured that McKinley was safe. He was hastily conveyed back to the city, no small feat, to be sworn in, wait, no small feat, to be sworn in, uh, wearing borrowed clothes in the library of another Delaware Avenue mansion. 
<clears throat> what was supposed to be the crowning achievement of the fair had dramatically turned. The fair closed on September 14th. The evening illumination, the fair's uh, uh, signature achievement, was not lit that night, and the fair's gates remained locked until September 16th. When it reopened, it was somber. Crowds were far, crowds were far smaller. John Milburn desperately tried to convince Americans that actually visiting the fair would be a tribute to McKinley, who had believed in it and in the American empire that it represented. But that didn't seem to help all that much. There were still some big attendance days, but in early October, Buffalo newspapers were signaling that the fair was going to be a financial bust and that those who had invested in it were going to seriously lose out. After one Buffalo Times article came out, investors began showing up at the bank that held the Pan Am bonds, demanding their money back. Soon, lines formed up and down the street of Buffalonian as blah, blah, blah. Soon, lines formed up and down the street as Buffalonians anxiously hoped to cash out their bonds. As Margaret Creighton describes the scene, Judge Lauren Lewis, a director of the bank, got up on a chair. Mm, Oh, okay. As Margaret Creighton describes the scene, quote, Judge Lauren Lewis, a director of the bank, got up on a chair to speak to those in the bank's lobby, saying, you ought, you ought, in the interests of Buffalo, to go away and do all you can to allay this absurd excitement. You should not have allowed yourselves to get into this foolish flurry. October did have one day that boasted the fair's highest single day attendance, October 19th, or Buffalo Day, at over 162,000 in attendance. Sorry, it says attendance twice really closely, and I was trying to think of a way to reword it, but there is no way, so it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, at over 162,000 in attendance. But that was an outlier. Attendance never met the levels that organizers hoped for, and by the time the fair closed for good on November 2nd, it had not turned the hoped over, <laughs> hoped over, oh my God, the fair had not turned the hoped for profit. The Buffalo Evening News editors tried to assess what role the assassination had played in lackluster attendance. Attendance started slow, but was building week to week over the summer. After September 6th, the next week noted a falling off of 50,000, and the next week exhibited a further shrinkage of 90,000 or more. Even the great week that included Buffalo Day with its immense attendance could not restore the figures that were common before the fifth day of September. It's plain that in the light of these figures that the exposition would have been a magnificent success in every way, but for the crowning sorrow that befell it when its trouble seemed wholly over. Wait, that's a quote? Yes. Okay. <laughs> should I reread, From... reread that or should I not? I don't think it matters okay. that much. I'm just going to say, quote, after September 6th, quote, and then I'll say, when its troubles seemed wholly over, end quote. And then I'll fix it if I need to. Further, oh. yeah, that's me. Um, so <laughs> further, the final days of the fair were marked by chaos rather than any kind of triumph. In the closing night, rowdy attendees destroyed the landscaping and beer drinkers rioted in the Paps Beer Hall on the Midway. To stop the melee, a waiter turned on a waiter hose. <laughs> a waiter turned on a waiter hose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting mixed up with the with the hose and the Germanness of Paps. Okay. Um to stop the melee, a waiter turned on a water hose and sprayed the crowd. The Buffalo Courier reported that someone in the crowd shouted that Paps was an anarchist, and this absurd rumor spread in all direction up and down the midway. This drove the crowd into more of a frenzy until a waiter finally sprayed the crowd with a water hose. Wait, I say that already. Yeah, it's just the way that I phrased it. I mean, okay. you could take out the first sentence, I guess. I was just explaining why he turned on the water hose. Okay. Um, this drove the crowd into more of a frenzy until the waiter finally sprayed that 
that um, crowd with that water hose. Um, Later that night, with spilled beer and water still sitting in puddles in the midway, John Milburn turned off the glowing exposition lights for the final time. The fair's organizers had hoped for 20 million attendees, but needed about 10 million to turn a profit. In the end, the Pan American Exposition had 8 million attendees. Many still believed that the exposition had been a good investment. The Buffalo Evening News doubled down on the intentions of the fair, reprinting a reassuring editorial from the Massachusetts Worcester Spy, which read, quote, We believe that the exposition has put Buffalo in a position to take a leading position among American cities, the place to which it aspires, the place to which it is entitled by natural advantages of position and accessibility to a great water power. That Buffalo is destined to rank with Chicago and New York seems certain, end quote. But despite the true believers, there was still a deficit. The fair had lost more than $6 million and would default on $3.5 million in bonds. Buffalonians hoped the federal government would bail them out with a relief bill. D'Alva Alexander, congressman from Western New York, petitioned the federal government for assistance, explaining to the Washington Post his reasoning, quote, there would have been no deficit, there would have been no deficit had there been no tragedy. Sorry, there's a machine outside beeping. Was that accurate? Right. That had McKinley not been shot at the Pan American and died in Buffalo, that the fair would have otherwise been like a smashing success. I mean, maybe crowds did get larger in September before the assassination and for Buffalo Day in October. But it was likely that it would have been. But was it likely that it would have been enough to get the fair to 10 million or more visitors? I mean, we'll never know. That's contingency for you. I feel like. The weather would have gotten worse and worse, so people probably would not have come. I don't know. Whatever. Right. And people probably weren't planning. Tra- oh, people probably weren't planning travel in yeah. the fall as much as they would have been in the summer. You know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah, there's just a million. There's a bunch of different factors. I mean, my I sort of fall on like, no, it probably wouldn't have magically been, you know, more successful had he mm-hmm. not died. But it wouldn't have been quite so dramatic a disaster yeah and also our disaster i don't know i kind of feel like i'm surprised more people didn't come when he was assassinated there i think Mm -hmm. i think if if he had died right then and there when the day he was shot i bet you that people would have come to commemorate him and stuff but it kind of Mm -hmm. diffused the situation because he lived for a while so people were Mm -hmm. like oh that was a close call you know maybe Mm -hmm. it's dangerous there or whatever but Mm -hmm. we don't need to go commemorate him and then he dies like a week later Mm -hmm. and then it seems too late to go and like set up you know vigils and things for him Mm -hmm. but it's like you know, but he still died. So it still kind of gives him a vibe. You know what I mean? Like, I wonder mm-hmm. if totally, I don't know. Cause I feel like a lot of times when people are assassinated somewhere, people actually gather there to like, you know, mm-hmm. commemorate them. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. So maybe just the way it kind of worked out. Um, when we started this episode, we talked about another important event that took place, um, at John Milburn's mansion on Delaware Avenue, um, that luncheon attended by the city's boosters and business leaders, along with honored out of state guests along with an honored out-of-state guest. That luncheon was organized to woo Walter Scranton, one of the Scranton brothers who operated Lackawanna Iron and Steel in northeastern Pennsylvania. We'll just refer to the company as Lackawanna Steel here, you know, for, for simplicity. Several of Buffalo's steel, wait, several of Buffalo's business elite, including Milburn, Charles, and Frank Goodyear, wait, Charles and Frank Goodyear, and John J. Albright, owned significant stock in Lackawanna Steel. Through this connection, they learned in the late 1890s that the Scranton brothers might be searching out a new location for their company. The luncheon was setting the luncheon was the setting for Buffalo's full court press on Scranton, working hard to sell him on Buffalo as the perfect location for Lackawanna's future. Milburn gave a speech extolling Buffalo's three key benefits as a site for the steel plant: access to the Great Lakes for iron ore, shipped from the Midwest, the might of Niagara Falls, generating vast amounts of power and labor in the form of recently arrived immigrants who would work for cheap. 
The following year, Scranton traveled to Buffalo again, this time to walk the land cited for such a project, south of the city of Buffalo along the shore of Lake Erie. With Milburn and John Albright's help, Scranton purchased 1,000 acres of lakefront property. Later, this chunk of land was bolstered by donated land from both the state of New York and the city of Buffalo. So they're like, they're very invested, right? They're just like handing him land. Yes. Soon, this previously undeveloped land was home to a massive steel factory. The Buffalo Times reported in 1900 that, quote, on entering the gates, the visitor is first impressed with the immensity of the plant before him. As far as his eye can see, he can see the signs of industry, see the furnaces belching out their molten contents, the cupolas spouting fire, smoke and cinders like the dragons of song and story, end quote. Oh my God, Two years late. So dramatic. <laughs> I know they're they are really over the top. <laughs> Uh, Two years later, the Buffalo Commercial Advertiser saw the fast, intense growth of Lackawanna Steel as the lifeblood of the quote-unquote new Buffalo. They wrote this, quote, cities all over the country are striving for factories. I'm going to say that again because I got a, it buzzed here. Cities all over the country, wait. Quote, cities all over the country are striving for factories. They realize that they are the lifeblood of commercial eminence, but no city, however persistently it may have angled, has landed so enormous an enterprise as that which is spreading itself over the two and a half miles of waterfront at Stony Point, which was the the previous name for the area that then becomes known as Lackawanna. There have been many mythical beginnings for the new Buffalo, but the real, the genuine, is finally here, end quote. <laughs> so a, a lot of emphasis being placed here on the the Lackawanna steel as like sort of becoming the lifeblood, the future of Buffalo, right? <clears throat> Within a couple of years, that undeveloped land uh, had turned into its own factory city, which would become which would come to be known as Lackawanna, containing not only several mills, but railroad lines, a shipping canal, and housing for laborers. So they actually name this sort of city within a city after the the company, Lackawanna. Right. That makes sense. Lackawanna Steel was immediately successful, filling orders from around the world and producing over a million tons of steel per year. While Lackawanna wasn't the only steel mill steel mill in town, it was the largest. Of the 10,000 people who worked in the steel industry in Buffalo, 6,000 worked at Lackawanna in the early 20th century. The business was impacted by various economic downturns and within a couple of decades was suffering from a lack of investment in new technology. In 1922, Lackawanna Steel was purchased by Bethlehem Steel, the second largest steel company in the nation. They infused the aging plant with tens of millions of dollars for renovations. The Great Depression did hit the steel industry, but it was also slowing down in the early 1930s because of its continued manufacturing of materials used in making railroad cars and rails, a technology that, while still important, was no longer the height of transportation technology. In 1935, Eugene Grace, the president of Bethlehem Steel, made the decision to transition to making materials for cars, a risky move that paid off. Not only did Buffalo's steel mills hit all-time production highs, easy access to materials drove auto manufacturing to Buffalo, a GM and a Chevrolet plant soon opened along the Niagara River north of the city. By the eve of World War II... Ew. (laughs) You're just as dramatic as the Buffalo Times. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> By the eve of World War II, 15,000 people worked in Buffalo's steel industry, 12,000 of them at Bethlehem. In 1939, with war manufacturing revving up, even as the U.S. clung to neutrality, steel in Buffalo was booming like never before, cranking out 10,000 tons of steel a day. By the tie, By the tie. By the time the war ended, the number of people working in steel and iron in the city had nearly doubled. In fact, lots of industries in western New York were booming. The auto industry, brass and copper manufacturing, machine shops, electrical equipment manufacture. Oh, my God. Electrical equipment factories, electrochemical and chemical plants, plus breweries and various specialty companies making wallpaper, furniture and other products. 
Steel and heavy industry might be what Buffalo became known for during this era, but the city's most recognizable industry was actually the one that had sustained it since the very early 19th century, the grain trade. Grain grown in the Midwest was shipped through the Great Lakes to the furthest eastern point, Buffalo, where it was offloaded and stored in the city's iconic grain elevators or transferred to flour mills and cereal companies. Overall, uh, a full 42% of the city's population worked in some kind of manufacturing. Buffalo was, at least according to the Buffalo Chamber of Commerce, commerce truly a working man's town. But this is an episode about contingency. Buffalo could have trucked along, cranked out industrial products and processing load after load of raw grains, but things happened, many of which had almost nothing at all to do with Buffalo. One was the final completion of a project that had been slowly moving forward since the 1930s, the creation of the St. Lawrence Seaway. The Seaway, a major international project between the U.S. and Canada that deepened the St. Lawrence River to create a shipping channel that would allow freight ships to to travel from North Atlantic down the St. Lawrence into Lake Ontario, which is the best Great Lake. According to me. Yeah. <laughs> Lake Erie um, sucks. <laughs> it is. I don't know. It is. Uh, Ontario is lovely. No, 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 you know, um, argument for me. Um, so anyway, this was supposed to travel down the North Atlantic, down the St. Lawrence, into Lake Ontario, and then throughout the rest of the Great Lakes. But some of you might be thinking, wait, how do the ships get, get how do ships get for, oh my God. I can't just say get. <laughs> okay. Uh, but some of you may be thinking, wait, how do ships get from Lake Ontario into Lake Erie? While the Niagara River does connect the two lakes, there's a pretty big obstacle between them. A little thing called Niagara Falls. Right. So it's not like you can just like <laughs> doopy doopy doo, like ride right. your boat down the Niagara River. <laughs> it doesn't work right yeah or up the niagara river like either right, way right. neither way is gonna work right. yeah um mm-hmm. so it's not possible to navigate from lake ontario to lake erie by way of the niagara river um the saint lawrence seaway could only work out wait oh my god why can't i fucking talk okay the saint <laughs> lawrence seaway could only work if there was some kind of navigable shipping channel connecting the lakes that actually already existed across the Niagara River in Ontario, Canada, um, which was the Welland Canal, which had connected the lake since the 1820s. All that pre-existing canal needed was some additional dredging to accommodate the bigger, deeper-hauled lake freighters. With some dredging and updates to the existing locks, the Welland Canal allowed for ships to pass easily from Lake Ontario into Lake Erie with no need to stop in Buffalo. Now, Buffalonians knew the Seaway Project was underway, but had done little to stop it. In 1932, in response to the signing of the first agreement to create the shipping channel, Edgar Black, then the president of the Buffalo Corn Exchange, said that the Seaway Project would, quote, make Buffalo a side port to the water of the Great Lakes. This may take some, this may take a long time, but the beginning of the project begins Buffalo's decline as a transportation point, end quote. So somebody at least was seeing sort of the the negative potential of the Seaway Project. Business interests like the Corn Exchange lobbied Washington Washington to abandon the project, but without much support and without much success. <clears throat> Other Buffalonians seemed, frankly, delusional about what the Seaway would mean for Buffalo's future as the critical hub for Great Lakes shipping. In 1955, knowing that the Seaway was not only under construction, but but almost done, the Buffalo Corn Exchange opened a new building in downtown Buffalo, staffed with clerks monitoring grain prices and more than a dozen inspectors overseeing grain quality. In June 1959, barely a month after the Seaway opened, Buffalo seemed still convinced that the Seaway was going to be a win for the city rather than a catastrophe. In one issue of the Courier Express, one page had five different headlines that all insisted that the Seaway was going to elevate Buffalo to the status of a world port. But that enthusiasm and positivity could not last. 
By 1962, the Courier Express was far less enthusiastic about the Seaway and was instead reporting on new railroad innovations that might help to compete with the Seaway. Quote, a new rail a new type rail car designed to reduce transportation costs and help restore Buffalo's once lively rail export grain trade to the eastern seaboard was exhibited here Tuesday to grain and rail interests, they reported. Grain executives say if shipping costs can be reduced sufficiently, Buffalo could be in a position to regain some of the millions of bushels of rail export grain. Uh, blah, blah. Buffalo could be in a position to regain some of the millions of bushels of rail export grain trade lost to the Seaway annually since 1959. It wasn't inevitable that Buffalo would be entirely bypassed. The grain still needed to be milled and processed somewhere, for instance. But the Seaway allowed other cities, such as Montreal, to build newer, cheaper, and more state-of-the-art mills that rendered Buffalo obsolete. Further, Buffalo could potentially have wooed takers, Lakers, <laughs> takers, <laughs> tankers. Okay. Further, <laughs> the lake. Okay. Further, the Lakers. <laughs> the Lakers. <laughs> I just feel like I've never heard the word Lakers before other than the Lakers. Okay. <laughs> Um, further, Buffalo could potentially have wooed Lakers into their ports for offloading, but the city's ports were designed for the old-fashioned schooners and steamers of the past, not the heavy, deep-hauled lake freighters of the mid-20th century. Ultimately, the Seaway, regardless of the delusional optimism of the Courier Express in 1959, was disastrous for Buffalo's economy. Grain shipments moved through Buffalo Grain shipments moving through Buffalo dropped precipitously. Um, before the Seaway opened, the Buffalo the buff, before the Seaway opened, Buffalo unloaded two hundred bushels of grain per year. Oh but wait, two hundred million. Okay, I was gonna say that's not really that many, Sarah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Um, before the Seaway opened, Buffalo unloaded 200 million bushels of grain per year. By the 1990s, only 20 million bushels of grain arrived in Buffalo per year. Rail transport of grain dropped from 7.5 million bushels in 1958 to 73,600 bushels in 1964. Winter grain shortage hung on by a thread. Storage. Like, winter grain. Okay. Winter grain is not a thing. It's just grain storage during the winter, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. <laughs> just making sure. Winter um, grain. <laughs> the old winter grains. I don't know. It sounds like it could be a thing, right? It sounds nice. <laughs> um, winter grain storage hung on by a thread for a while as the seaway was mostly frozen during the winter and ships had to offload into grain elevators. My dad worked in a grain elevator as a little kid. Really? Yeah. Well, he oh, was that's really, wild. he's really old. So he was born in 1939. So that makes oh, sense. Oh my goodness. Um, but soon uh, even that was gone as companies like Cargill, the Minnesota-based grain company, lost their deals with railroads that had made rail transportation for their product from Buffalo to the Eastern Seaboard profitable. By 1964, only one person worked in the new Corn Exchange building. And by the mid-1990s, only three of 38 grain elevators were in use. In 1996, the corn exchange dissolved. Buffalo's days as the leading grain port in the country were over. Now, Buffalo's grain elevators were an intrinsic part of the city. They were massive, iconic buildings all along the waterfront, but they sit now empty and in some cases crumbling. A couple of years ago, why don't you start there? Why don't you? Okay. Because Sorry, the foot just fell off of this thing. I'm fixing it. Hang on. So I'm going to add this to you. And then I'll just keep talking. Right, right? Yeah, that'd be fine. Okay. A couple of years ago, my favorite, uh, um, one of the grain elevators, the Great Northern Elevator on Ganson Street, lost a significant chunk of its facing during a Lake Erie windstorm. And I personally think that it's only added to its charm. It just something about it looks like more sort of Rust Belt Buffalo to me that I, I think it looks actually kind of cool. And I I added a very um, a very cool picture of it uh, to the to the show notes if you're interested in seeing that. But 
While the grain industry, long considered the stable centerpiece of Buffalo's economy and identity, disappeared, the heavy industry that had boomed since the early 20th century continued to chug along. Unemployment was at record lows in the mid to late 60s, with around 60,000 people working in the steel and auto industries in the region. In 1964, both Bethlehem Steel and Republic Steel invested in their technology, upgrading old-fashioned furnaces with new oxygen-fueled ones, quote, able to produce as much steel in one hour as the old furnaces had produced in six, end quote. Bethlehem, still in uh, Bethlehem, still the far larger mill, employed 6,000 people and produced 6 million tons of steel, becoming the largest steel company in the United States. The auto industry was also thriving, employing 22,000 people across eight different plants. In the mid-1960s, Buffalo historian Mark Goldman writes, the auto industry in the city set new payroll records. The success of the auto industry in Buffalo meant a number of other car-related businesses were also setting records for production in the 1960s, such as Dunlop Tire, American Brass, American Radiator, Buffalo Tool and Die, and Trico Windshield Wipers. But all this boom very quickly went bust. Very quickly, steel work went from the most solid, well-paying job in Buffalo to creating a jobs crisis for a number of complex, interlocking reasons, but mostly because of cheaper and more efficient foreign competition. American heavy industry faltered and failed in the 1970s. In 1971, in a shock to the city, Bethlehem Steel suddenly laid off half its employees. Rumors abounded that the company was going to sell the Lackawanna plant or worse yet, close it entirely. Bethlehem Steel Corporation took out huge, uh, roughly half-page ads in Buffalo newspapers featuring an interview with Stuart Court and Louis Foy, chairman and president of Bethlehem Steel Corporation, respectively. Can I um, interrupt there for one second? Yeah. <clears throat> that I just want to, I put, I put interview in quotes there because it's like very, it's an ad. It's not actually an interview, right? Like it's a journalist is not interviewing them. They put it together to make it look like a Q&A between someone and these two people. But it's like it is a half page ad for Bethlehem Steel, right? Like it, it's essentially propaganda <laughs> right yeah um yeah uh, yeah i just wanted to be clear that the interview was not actually like a sit down with like say the buffalo news it, it's an ad okay um intended if you want to just start okay. at that as a new sentence sure so um intended to reassure buffalonians that the company's leadership wasn't interested wasn't interested in abandoning the Lackawanna plant. Wait. So you could say the ad was intended. Sorry. I thought you were just telling me to start the sentence with intended. So I was like, okay. (laughs) Um, So this, this propaganda, um, this, this company propaganda, I suppose, intended to reassure Buffalonians that the company's leadership wasn't interested in abandoning the Lackawanna plant, but their answers also blamed the problems in the steel industry on high taxes, stricter environmental controls, and unions. When asked about labor negotiations with the Steelworkers Union, they responded that they hoped to negotiate without the need for a strike. Then answered a question about the threat posed by foreign steel by saying that, quote, steel imports are always more attractive in a period of labor negotiations when steel is in great demand, end quote. In another ad, Louis Foy said of the Lackawanna plant, quote, it was quite obvious that we're in deep trouble unless all of our employees improve their productivity, end quote. To Bethlehem Steel's leadership, if foreign steel was going to pose a problem, it would be the fault of the workers, not the bosses. I, I did a lot of like primary research for this episode, which I don't typically do, but I just had oh, I had access to newspaper databases. Um, and so instead of sort of just reading what other historians had said about this, I was just like, well, I'm just going to look this up and see if I can find these ads. Right. And I was like livid. Like it was just so transparently like, I mean, it sounds, I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but it was like (laughs) straightforwardly capitalist propaganda. Right. It's like, well, you know, foreign 
foreign steel imports wouldn't be such a threat if the workers would just work more and stop right. asking for better wages. That's literally transparently what they're saying. Right. Um, they're, like when, they're when, blaming... when union busters go to like Wegmans and they're all like, here's the reason why I don't want a union. And right. here's the reason why it's all on you guys. Like right. it's, it's very, it's so like obvious that they're working in the interests of yeah. the bosses of the company. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this yeah. is just, this is them blaming <clears throat> a faltering economy and deindustrialization on workers with who have no power, <laughs> right? right? I mean, it's just absolutely ludicrous to me. Right. Um, <laughs> Sarah, primary source based <laughs> tirade. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's um, important. I think it's an important part of the episode. So I'm just going to put it in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, layoffs continued through the early 1970s from an all time low unemployment rate in the mid 1960s. By 1975, unemployment in Buffalo hit 12 percent. By 1977, a notoriously not a great year for Buffalo, um, the steel industry in the United States had essentially collapsed. Bethlehem Steel posted hundreds of millions of dollars in losses and thousands more were laid off, leaving less than half of the numbers of employees that there had been in 1965. Finally, in December 1982, Bethlehem announced Bethlehem Steel announced that it would shut down essentially all but a tiny bit of the steel manufacturing at the Lackawanna plant, leaving a minuscule 1300 workers on the job. The front page of the Buffalo News on December 27th was dismal. Buffalo Major <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo Mayor Jimmy Griffin was stunned. Quote, it's a shock, the, the news reported him saying. New York State Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan said that the situation in Lackawanna was an example of the state of the union, meaning the you know, state of the nation. Mm -hmm saying that the nation was in, quote, a desperate depression and that, quote, the people in the White House don't know what's happening out there. And I think that's really interesting. A an interesting quote to me in 1982, when a lot of people were sort of crowing about the ascendancy of Reagan and conservatism, that like that's when things are actually the worst for average blue collar people in Buffalo. Right. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and and not just Buffalo, certainly other places as well. But and um, they're calling it out kind of. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. The late December 1982 Buffalo newspapers really just hammer home how devastating this was for the city. The pages were just literally full of articles obsessing over Bethlehem's closure. Articles recounted the timeline of Bethlehem's statements over the past year and suggested that, like the St. Lawrence Seaway, Buffalo should have seen this coming, pointing out that the Bethlehem leadership had consistently pointed to the Lackawanna plant as a problem for the company. But more devastating were interviews with average Buffalonians, whose lives centered for generations, in some cases, on the Lackawanna plant. One article included a quote from a steel worker who was sitting drinking beer at a place frequented by plant employees saying, quote, I really don't know what I'm going to do now. Uh, the 37 year old father of two said, uh, I bought a house. I got a hefty mortgage payment to make. And there aren't any jobs for me to chase down now that the plant has shut down. Just um, just people just. With, with no options, right? Mm -hmm. The owners of the restaurant also worried in this article that no one would come to, to eat at their restaurant anymore, pointing to the fact that Lackawanna was a company town. Who's going to want to come here for dinner? People just don't go to Lackawanna for dinner the way that they might to Buffalo for a night out. I mean, fair point. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Still uh, true. It's still true. Um, another man was more bitter, saying, quote, I saw it coming. They bled that company dry and we saw it coming. This place will be a ghost town now. And it's all the fault of the damn politicians. I knew it all along, but I'm just a worker. So who's going to listen to me? Well, now I guess they wish they'd listen to people like me. End quote. Man. 
1898, when Buffalo's leading businessmen wined and dined Walter Scranton at that fancy luncheon, they hoped that by luring Lackawanna Steel to Buffalo, that they would make Western New York into a center for the booming Gilded Age steel industry. The luncheon, it turned out, worked so well that within a few decades, not only was Scranton's Lackawanna Steel booming, the town uh, the town that sprang up and around the mill named itself for the company. But while Buffalo's identity as a steel town was born from a moment of contingency, it was also undone by factors that could never have been foreseen in 1898. Foreign competition from countries that could crank out steel without labor protections or living wages. Conservative politicians that eroded union strengths and de-incentivized corporate bosses from hiring American laborers and the faltering economy of the 1970s and downturn in car manufacturing. We could have a similar episode about many cities in the U.S. and around the world. It's it's not that Buffalo is unique, especially in its history as a de-industrializing city in the late 20th century, right? Pittsburgh has a similar story, as does Detroit and Cleveland. But to me... Buffalo is an example of a city where contingent moments have made a significant difference in fate. The difference sometimes between success and failure, thriving and scraping by. Discuss. The end. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a good thing that I was on this episode with you. Um, yeah. A Buffalonian born and bred, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Yeah, you're the only one of us who's who's, you know, family. That's true. Not only were you yeah. born and raised in Buffalo, but your family has deep roots in Buffalo, yeah. right? My whole family, yeah. Um, I don't know. My my grandfather worked for National Grid, so he mm -hmm. like was lucky in that his fortunes weren't particularly bound bound up with with mm -hmm. this. Um, so um, I guess in that sense, my family was lucky. But I do always remember like my dad talking about working in the grain elevators when he was young. Mm -hmm. So that would have been like, like very young, like before <laughs> he probably should have been working like a right. teenager or something. Um, yeah. This was in the late forties, I guess. Wow. wow. Um, and so uh, he, yeah, he can remember and like playing on them. I don't know how, how much he was working so much as like helping or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. He, I think he also worked there like as a young adult who like actually got a wage and stuff. Um, so that would have been in the fifties. So um, yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I can remember my dad talking about that and um, yeah. you know, his parents were immigrants um, and, and they, I'm not even sure what they did, but um, yeah, it's just weird. And I always remember thinking that it was so weird because the green elevators as I know them are just, sort of weird post-industrial decay right. eyesore thing totally yeah. and totally. so he was like oh that's the one I worked in and I was like what <laughs> it's so weird yeah and it seems it it seems like it's been you know centuries since those grain elevators were yeah. operational and it's not it, it really exactly. is not some of them were still being used in the 90s right right it's so weird um, yeah but for some reason we think of like the glory days of Buffalo as being very very far in the past right which is really not right um, I don't know. And, Nowadays, my students, my my Gen Z students would be like, right. oh, my God, the late 1900s, you know, I know. Exactly. <laughs> so 9-11 so was before my time. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but it, it's interesting to me as a transplant to Buffalo that like this period, uh, this the, the post-industrial period of Buffalo is what the basically the only thing that I knew about Buffalo. As somebody who grew up in northern New York, not, you know, not in the city, had I had never been to Buffalo, but it, it, which is weird when you, you know, you think about growing up in upstate you know, New York, you'd think that at some point you'd have to go to the city. But like it was just an irrelevant city and it was a city that was sort of, you know, it, it was. I don't want to say scary, but there was definitely the sense that like it was rusty, yeah. you know, it was not there was nothing there. There was mm -hmm. nothing there. And that's not the case anymore at all. Um, right. Buffalo is a very different town over the past 15 or 20 years and and in a way that is energizing and exciting. Um, but one thing that I read um, that really stood out to me is that at one point as they were sort of panicking, um, 
as Bethlehem Steel was leaving, was pointing out like how Rochester was dodging all of this economic, all these economic bullets, right? Because Rochester had basically a tech economy before the tech economy boom of the early 2000s, right? Um, Because they were focused on Kodak and Xerox. And that's where all of my family, or at least my mom's side of the family is all from Rochester. And so they were all, Mm -hmm. this was the glory days for them, you know, the eighties and nineties, they all worked for Xerox and they all made really good money. You know, Mm -hmm. now Rochester has lost all of that because nobody uses cameras, Yeah, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Um, and nobody uses Xerox machines. Like, you know, Xerox virtually doesn't exist, I think anymore. Um, And so it's just very interesting how these things a city can really pin their hopes on an industry, but that industry doesn't necessarily have to exist forever. Right. And I think there is no way to see it coming. I mean, what if, what if the, um, you know, American automobile industry had, it had gone a different way. What if they Mm -hmm. had started with, you know, I don't know, um, electric vehicles or something or had stumbled or like really early on, or if they mm-hmm. had, um, designed, um, you know, I don't know, like high speed trains instead or something. I mean, there's like a million different ways it could have gone. Right. That right. It, right. So, so I don't think that you can see it coming. I think that kind of comes from, um, you know, sort of upset and, um, I guess bitter, but that seems like I'm being judgmental, but sort of, you know, uh, you know, rightfully bitter people who are looking back like, oh, we should have known mm-hmm. that it was going to end this way. Um, mm-hmm. cause it's, there's something comforting in, I think it's comforting to tell ourselves that it was always meant to be this way mm-hmm. because then we don't have to torture ourselves about what could have been. And, right, right. You know, and so there's something about, it gives you a feeling of control, you know? So when Mm -hmm. people say, oh, we should have seen this coming and, and they kind of make comments like that, like, um, that it's, it's not true. It's comforting. It makes you feel better, but I don't think that it's ever true. And as historians, I think we know that because we see contingent moments that, um, we know by studying these moments that they could have gone a different way. A million things could happen. We could have had some kind of you know, horrible earthquake at some point that made us have to rebuild. And then with that rebuild, then um, we changed what we base our industry on. Like, you know, there's like a million different things that could. Have right. Happened, so, right. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I really enjoyed writing this. I, and I, I especially really enjoyed looking back into these newspapers and like, like I've, I, as someone who grew up very close to the St. Lawrence river, the St. Lawrence Seaway was a very big part of my life, but in a very different way. And I'd never, ever, it was almost just natural, right? Like I, I actually, when I learned that they like dredged it to make it a seaway, I was like, it, yeah. <laughs> it's a river. What are you talking about? You know? <laughs> um, but like never, of course, had any idea the impact that it had in Buffalo. And so it was very interesting to go back and look at sort of how Buffalonians were talking about the Seaway project, even as it was opening, you know, sort of knowing with the benefit of hindsight, knowing what's going to happen. And Buffalo is like, this is gonna be great. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's how they came to that take. I truly do not understand. But, you know, that was, I think, a good way of getting at contingency for students and for, you know, us is looking at contemporary reports because Mm -hmm. they didn't see it coming. Right. Like, it did not have to go that way. It the 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 outcome that we know now hadn't happened yet. Yeah, so you get always, that you, you get that yeah. moment, right? I always have to explain that to my students. And what I use is COVID for them because I'm like, yeah, you yeah. lived through COVID, but we're so close to COVID that you really don't know what the long term impact is going to be. Like you you uh-huh. can't you're not able to analyze how it's impacted long-term mental health or how it's impacted the disability community or how it has um, impacted um, health outcomes in the long run because we have no way of knowing. And so, you know, I give them examples of like, what if, you know, 30 years from now, people who are studying COVID um, say that 
uh, you know, that our social interactions changed um, yeah. because of COVID. And we know now that, you know, people's parties are smaller and their holiday get togethers are smaller than they were. And we actually have the data to show that. And, right. you know, that's not something you can understand when you're living through it because, right, right. you know, you, you are just one of those data points, right? You can't, and you can't see beyond right. that. So I always try to use that to explain to my students, you know, because a lot of times it's easy to look back at like people who were living in a, in a particular time and say like, oh my God, why didn't they just do this? You know, like right. it would have saved right. everything. And it's like, well, cause they didn't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. I, I was just talking about this exact thing um, with my students in my reacting to the past class. And then that's a huge part of reacting to the past to the past is, is mm -hmm. making stu forcing students into the contingency of those, of those situations, those historical moments. Right. And um, one of the things that they were sort of aghast by is in the game that we were just playing was Kentucky 1861 to end the game. You have a, basically an entire day where you just do a series of die rolls and the die rolls tell um, the people playing like how the war ends up. And so our war after like every, all the decisions they made, all of the negotiating, everything came down to just a die roll. And the die roll was a two year war in which the federal army won, right? The union won, but there was never any abolition. There was no emancipation. Mm. It's just how the die roll came out. And they were like, that's not possible. And I was like, it was absolutely possible. Right. There was nothing that, that there was nothing written in stone in 1861 or two or three that said that the slaves had to be freed at the end of the Civil War. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that was not inevitable. And they were like, you can't do that. I was like, yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And it makes you think to me, it actually does make the sort of great man history seem kind of interesting because then it makes you feel like, oh, like did did emancipation hang on like those few people like Lincoln Seward right. and all those, like did, did it right. hang on their personal, per, you know, their personalities and their life experiences and their philosophies about life. Yeah. And you can't say that they 100% impacted exactly how it went, but you have a feeling that if they had been different people, that it could have gone differently. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really, and you could go down a real contingency rabbit hole, right? Oh yeah. And like yeah. sometimes it goes into weird places. Like there's a lot of um, like counterfactuals. Yeah. In, like in the Civil War world, there's mm -hmm. what what is his name? Newt Gingrich wrote a series of counterfactual Civil War histories that are like, what's the point of this? You know right. what I mean? Like this didn't happen. This is just a novel. <laughs> right. You know, it's a fa it's a fantasy. It's yeah. just a fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I think that gets kind of silly, but, you know, th th there's a reason that those exist because it could have gone a different way. So, yeah. So I'm, I had a book called What If that I loved and I got rid of it. It was like a trade press book, but it was really interesting to me. And one of the things was like, what if um, the summers from like 1350 to 1400 or something like that? had been on an average of two degrees cooler or like one, oh, I think it, right. it could have even been one degree cooler. Um, it would have saved like dozens of millions of lives um, yeah. because of um, the, the black death. Um, That's and wild. Just, yeah. You know, things like that. And, yeah. and obviously there's no way that they could have known that. And obviously there's no way to control that anyway. So it, it's not even something that that's not something right. that was in anyone's control. Um, right. But it just demonstrates but, sort of the factors that are at play. Yeah. You know, in, in determining what happens, you right. know, exactly. things that are just totally outside of, you know, a lot of this was outside of Buffalo's control. Even if they had seen it coming, what could they have done? Right. It's hard. To, it's hard to turn around your entire economy in a, in the space of a couple of years right. as, as Buffalo finds out. Right. Yeah. So. And this is my therapy speaking, but <laughs> my, having been someone who's been in therapy forever, um, is that like, yeah, you, you we're just like these specks of dust that are floating around and at everyone else's will. And so the only thing we really can control is our response to those things. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you, it's as a person, that's something that a lot of times we know, like we can't control other people's thoughts or all these outside factors, but we can control how we respond. Um, that, I don't know that I, I try to think about that as to give me comfort. Like it, that's sort of like a stoic approach to things, a stoic yeah. philosophy. Like I, I, instead of 
being like, oh, well, we're always meant to end up here. Cause, cause that's, right. I think where humans automatically go like, oh, yeah. this great nation. We've, exactly. you know, all of these, all of these right. things went exactly into place so that America could be the America it is today. And I try right. not to do that. Cause it's like you said, teleological and it's, and it's not, it's not how we were trained as historians. So yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully you enjoyed listeners this episode. I enjoyed putting it together and and I I really think that these episodes are will be helpful in the classroom. Uh my future students will be listening to them. So, can hello, I say one students. thing? Hey, future yes, students, please. what's up? One thing, the whole time we've been doing this, I've been looking into the dreamy eyes of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> they're very seductive they're like when i turned my computer around i was like okay i gotta do some like i gotta do some stage <laughs> setting <laughs> but that that has always been there he does look kind of sultry there doesn't he, he? does doesn't he he's very yeah. looks very seductive i've never been particularly into him but now i kind of see it yeah yeah <laughs> okay hey, do sorry. you do the outro i don't know anything i didn't oh put it okay there. so um visit our website at digpodcast.org visit our instagram and twitter and threads and facebook dig underscore history we have a facebook group called dig history pod squad it's just a small group not super super active we we you know we post a couple times a week or whatever about different memes that we've seen and things like that um and everyone's sort of welcome to share uh and um, check out, yeah, definitely check out our Insta, dig it underscore history, because we've been reviving it after um, it's been hibernating for quite yes. a while. So we've yes. had lots of stories and highlights and um, reels. And we have our wonderful intern, um, Dante Gilbert, who is um, putting together our reels and things because we're old ladies. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how to do those things anymore. Yeah. Um, so definitely check that out and please engage and interact because it really helps us reach um, a younger audience, which, you know, I think young people deserve to hear this kind of stuff too. So, sure. um, and then we also have teacher resources for educators on our website. Remember that's digpodcast.org. That's all yep. I got for you. Bye. That's it. All right. Bye. Good job us.